Body hairbands, do you really know how to use it? Welcome everyone to Traders of the World, our new interview show where we bring inspiring stories about the financial market and incredible guests. I am Mateus Massari and I am extremely excited to be here. With me, I have Flavio Lemos and Alain Soares. Okay, Matt. I'm Professor Flavio Lemos, president of the Brazilian local chapter of the CMT Association and also author of some investment books, as you know it. I have just completed 50 years old half a center of life. I'm a Brazilian, a proud father of two boys, and we are speaking English because we want this show to inspire new traders from all over the world. I hope you all like it. Please click on it and spread our word. Hi, my name is Alan Soares, and I'm very happy to share this time with you. Great, I'm certain that we have an amazing conversation with our guests. Speaking out of our guests, today we have a father and daughter. You know them for 20 years, right Flavio? Yes, Matthew. Uh, he came first in 2006 for the Expo Trader Brazil conference in Rio de Janeiro with the whole family. By the way, they always travel together when John is going to speak. His daughter was just a kid at the time with wonderful pink chicks. I'm very proud he was also my sponsor in the, at the CMT Association. Great, so let's dive in. He's a world famous analyst, creator of the Bollinger Bands and founder of the Bollinger Capital Management. And she is the director of client relations at the Bollinger Capital Management and passionate about social entrepreneurship. Please welcome Zoe and John Bollinger. Hello. Hello, <laughs> well thanks for having us. Um, I am John Bollinger. This is my daughter, Zoe Bollinger, and together we are the investment team here at Bollinger Capital Management. Thank you for having us, and you know we're really looking forward to the conversation. Sorry that we're not there in Sao Paulo with you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much for you both being here. So let's, let's start. John, a wonderful curiosity for our audience. You have told me in the wash in Washington at lunch. Could you tell us which job you had before being an analyst and how have you begun your investment career? Well, um, my first job out of school was as a cameraman in the movie industry, a cinematographer. Um, and uh, I did that until I was about 30. Um, during that period, um, uh, my mother, um, required some help with her retirement uh and she knew that i was interested in the stock market and asked me to if i could if i could help her out so um i gave it the i gave it a go um using the traditional tools brokerage house research and fundamental analysis following the news and all of that which was an utter disaster and then i discovered technical analysis and as soon as I discovered technical analysis, I was able to start doing a good job. Thank you very much. So it's your mother's fault. You it is my mother's career. fault, almost entirely. <laughs> John, you are a bookman, a very studious market analyst, and also you are a money manager, a publisher and a father. Tell us about some of your latest research. What have you been doing most recently? Well, some of the recent themes um, that we've been exploring here are alternative streams of returns. Uh, you know, if you if you take a very long term look at the U.S. stock market, the U.S. US stock markets obviously are our major focus. Um, it, it produces a, a, a great set of returns over the decades. However, it's punctuated by these periods of, of, of real panic, uh, 73, 74, that is 1973, 1974 is a perfect example. The average stock on the US fell by 50%. Um, yet over time, um, that's the set of returns that the stock market delivers um, is in the eight, nine, 10% range, depending on what you use as a start date and, and, and what averages you use, such like that. So what we've been working on recently is how to incorporate um, rigorous technical analysis, market timing, 
um, using many of the indicators that, that you all know and love to ameliorate those periods in which we have very big drawdowns. We're not so much worried about the, the periods in which you have five or 10% drawdowns. That, that, that was the definition of a correction when I came into the market. But once we start to exceed a, a, a pullback of, of five to 10%, we wanna be hedged. We wanna be, uh, um, we wanna be in some defensive position. So for the past year, uh, year and a half or, or two years, um, we have been working on a rigorous methodology um, to allow us to deliver a stream of stock market returns to our clients without the big drawdowns that the stock market occasionally delivers. Nice. So, of course, I need to ask this for our, our audience. How should a trader use properly the Bollinger Bands? Could you give us some example? Well, um, you know, perhaps the, the the thing that traders need to understand more than anything else to start with is that Bollinger Bands are a tool. They are not a trading system per se. Um, they're a tool that defines high and low on a relative basis. By definition, when prices touch the upper band, prices are high. By definition, when prices touch the lower band, prices are low. And you know, traders can can take that information um, and assemble that into rigorous trading systems. For example, um, we can look to define W bottoms where the the market comes down and makes a low, bounces and makes makes another low. Often a, a a new price low accompanied by a lot of panic, and then rallies again. By using Bollinger Bands, um, we can diagnose those patterns and help traders find entry points where the amount risked is relatively small in relation to the potential gain. And that's the real key to, to all, all of Bollinger Band trading. We want to we want to risk a relatively small amount in pursuit of a, a, a larger gain. And the, the other side of that coin is we want to find trade setups where the odds of success are in our favor. So when you combine those two pieces, um, uh, a, a good chance of success and, and, and a small amount of risk in relation to a larger amount of gain, you have a very viable trading approach. John, multicollinearity is the occurrence of high intercorrelations among two or more independent variables. What could lead to misleading results in analysis? So, how could a trader avoid multicollinearity using technical analysis? So, this leads into one of my favorite stories. Many, many years ago, I, I was at an uh, investment conference and, and a fellow came up to me with a, a, a printout, a, a chart printout. And he had a, a, a printout of price and, and Bollinger Bands and, and such like that. And underneath it, he had like nine indicators, um, uh, you know, in, in all, all stacked up. And he looked and, and he said, so, you know, we came down and we tagged the lower band and, and, and we, we had this divergence. And I, and I have nine pieces of confirmation. Um, but the trade failed. How can that be? You know, nine pieces of confirmation. And so I, I sat with him for a while and I, I worked it out. Each of the indicators that he used was basically the same indicator. They were all various forms of momentum indicators. And so they all gave the same result. So instead, he thought that he had nine independent indicators, but what he really had was the same indicator in nine variations. You, mm -hmm. you you correctly identified the problem. It's called multicollinearity. It means they're all related. They're all they're they're all linked together. So um, the bottom line is is there was just one piece of confirmation and um, not nine pieces of confirmation. So he had a false sense of confidence when he entered that trade. And of course, he entered that trade because of that sense of confidence with too much leverage and, and too big a position and so on and so forth. So, so it, it was a, a real disaster um, for him, but it didn't need to be. Um, 
what I like to suggest is that people use different kinds of indicators, like a, a momentum indicator, um, a trend indicator, a supply demand indicator, a, maybe a volume indicator, something along those lines. Different, different, really different types of of indicators. And one of the real problems that people have is they haven't uh, studied the indicators. When when we came, I came into this business. We had to calculate all these indicators by hand. So I know how they work and I know how they can hurt you, right? And, and that's really important. So I think if I had advice to give uh, traders, what I'd say is really study the indicators, pick up the the original articles in which they were described and, 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 and read them very carefully and try to understand um, try to understand what they are one, one of the great things to do is to use uh, um, um, some synthetic data um, say say you know idealized data where you know market comes down turns on a dime and heads north and then maybe um, makes a, a a complicated top and comes down and and that way and th and then you know add the indicators to that and see how they behave um, in those environments so that you can really understand um what the message that they're 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 telling you mm -hmm. i i have read uh, george lane's books about stochastics stochastics is one of the, <laughs> the indicators that people totally misunderstood because they some some guy in a program chart said uh, you have to to sell at 80 and buy at 20 that's it there is a lot of different stuff between uh, what he tells you on the book, at the book, and what people does it, actually. They don't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, yeah. a, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And a lot of moving average with MACD uh, uh, showing the same information at all. Mm -hmm. uh. So, Joe, going in the same direction as your last answer, how do you think new traders could be better prepared for this dynamic current market? I like to say that, you know, you, you should read the classics uh, um, of, of technical analysis. There's so much information there. Uh, um, Flavio just mentioned uh, um, George Lane. Um, there, there are many other great books um, that are out. Um, many of them have been translated in, into many secondary languages. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of literature uh, um, out there. Richard D. Wyckoff is is one of my favorites. He he was writing almost a hundred years ago, but when you when you pick up his work and read it, it reads like contemporary analysis. You know, I mean, he was he was so smart. He was so far up the up the case. Uh, Martin Pring's early books on technical analysis are, are I think are really excellent general works on technical analysis because. He focuses on the basic concepts, the underlying ideas. Um, so, uh, you know, the more you read, and 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 the, and and I really think that you should focus on on reading the classics. Uh, there's just so much information there, um, great information. Uh, every everybody thinks that you know the markets have changed and morphed and and all that, but you know the bottom line is they really haven't. It's still buying and selling. It's still it's still. You know, I want to sell you my shares, and, and you you want to sell me your shares, and you know, and it, it's that conflict uh, over time. Those human dynamics they, they they don't change, and that's what really lies at the core of technical analysis. So I know that your family has accompanied you, and in your presentation around the world, even in Rio, you were all together. The future of a family business is only as promising as the competence and acumen of the next generation. What challenges do you face in passing your passion and knowledge on to the next generation? And what else is your style to motivate Zoe? Well, I, I, I think, you know, perhaps she, she can answer that a little bit, but I'll just uh, hint that the, 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 the thing that I found the most challenging in, in, um, teaching Zoe was to figure out what to teach her, right? I, I have this fantastic body of knowledge. You know, I, I, I have very deep 
understanding of TA and, 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 and its history. But, you know, not all of it is relevant and, and, and such like that. So it's just thinking through um, and making like, like a plan to transmit this, this knowledge was the biggest challenge for me. But I, I think Zoe should, should, should really answer for herself. <laughs> so please, Joe. Go on. Yeah. You know, I think he undersells himself. He did a really exceptional <laughs> job of the training. Um, I think, you know, it's a matter of also where it really came together was as it interwove with what was happening in the markets. You know, <clears throat> I had perhaps the pleasure, perhaps the pain of joining the markets in sort of an interesting period for US markets. Um, like to joke, I, I really joined the business. I'd been trading before that, but I joined the business in 2019, just in time for a big end of year correction, which was followed by quite a large rally and then COVID and then quite a large rally and then 2022 um, with inflation and deflation and all of that. So every year I've, I've relearned that the market has something to teach you every year. I planned all that, by he the did. way. He did. He put in a request. So any complaints about recent years, interesting markets can be uh, sent to him. But you know, if I had tried to train her from 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 like 1992 to 1998, you know, that's six years where we never had more than a 10 percent correction and, 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 and such like that It would have been really hard. But we had really dynamic markets after she joined the company. So we were able to you know i was able to tell her you know what i was seeing how, why i was making these decisions how i was making these decisions the tools that 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 i was using she she was able to learn in a real time laboratory um none of this uh um none of this paper trading or or, or you know none of this theoretical stuff it was a it was a, a practical immersion and I think that she's much the better for that. Um, you can. Yeah, it was certainly good as we worked on trading systems. You know, he, he talked about the idea of taking some synthetic data and using that to analyze how indicators respond. Um, and so we do a bit of that, but his, his real mantra is don't paper trade it. You know, you'll, you'll learn if it works, if you actually use it. Um, and so we built a, a couple of different trading systems together and, we had the benefit of really getting those tested in real time, quite variable markets and seeing what worked in which environments and you know what in fact might be a tweak or what you don't want to tweak because this is a situation and you just recognize the strengths and weaknesses of a different approach. Yeah, when, when, when Zoe came uh, um, into um, the company, she had a real strong interest in, in impact investing, um, social entrepreneurship and, and, and such. And um, she wanted to put together a, a, an investment program, you know, based around those ideas. And that was fine by me. Um, but I, I looked at the history of, of you know, re responsible investing for, for a, a, a want of a better term. And it, it seemed that um, if you really wanted to be an ethical investor, um, you, you, have, you know, the, the track rec record was dismal that, uh, you know, the, these people had had, you know, yes, made ethical decisions, but at the same time, they'd thrown away a tremendous amount of return. So I didn't want to do that. Um, you know, I'm, I was happy to do um, to get involved in ethical investing, impact investing, um, and, and such. But I wanted to do it with performance um, as well. So that that was the first real project that we worked on together. You know, I brought my knowledge of, of relative strength and portfolio construction and, and such like that. And she brought her knowledge of impact investing and social social entrepreneurship. We married those ideas and came up with a terrific program. Um, and, you know, that's the way I've always liked it. I, I've always called that, uh, um, you know, so, so, sort of a welding together of these pieces. I've always called that rational analysis, where you take the equal parts of fundamental analysis or equal parts of technical analysis. I like to say that you take the best out of each toolkit, out of the best ideas out of the fundamental toolkit, the best ideas out of the technical toolkit. 
you combine them. And I think that can produce a really superior um, results. And I think the impact, the results of our impact in investing program are a great demonstration of the potential of that. Nice. And I think that's the beauty of uh, a family business, right? Uh, you have someone to guide you through the way. Oh, yes. Nice. Zoe, how many counties have you accompanied your family to John's presentations? How old were you on the first trip abroad to his presentation? Well, have you asked me this a little bit as we were prepping for today? And I was trying to think about the actual number. The truth is, I don't know. I have to make a list. But I'm <laughs> quite no fortunate. They took me along quite a bit, starting from a very young age. The first trip was at eight months. Um, so still very much wow. in being carried around uh, to Singapore, uh -huh. Hong Kong, and Tokyo. Um, I wish I could say I remembered it, but I do not. Um, <laughs> but I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a, it was the start of a, of a really nice path. And I got to travel with him to many places, including Brazil, and listen to his presentations and kind of learn the ropes. Yeah, hmm. we're a, a real family values sort of family. So the opportunity that we had to, to travel together over the years was you know, in, invaluable to us. Yeah. So Zoe, tell us about your beginning as a trader. Up from the start, do you want to follow your father's work? Please don't lie to us. What did you study? So I was quite stubborn um, and I went with really? him on many trips and I watched him work and I said, absolutely not. I'm not going to do this. And Largely, that was partially because of how successful he was and how well known his work was. And I very much wanted to make my own way and make my own mark and not just start kind of coming up in his shadow. So I always swore up and down. People would ask me all through my childhood, oh, so you're going to follow in his footsteps. I was like, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> So I went to university for economics and international relations and very much with the thought from all the travel that perhaps I would be a diplomat. And as I started taking all of the diplomacy courses and peace and conflict resolution courses, I came more and more to realize that if the economy wasn't working, none of the rest of it really worked. And slowly but surely went more and more in a business econ direction and went out and worked for several years in a variety of different industries doing international business, trade, business development. Um, and at the same time was starting to earn a bit of my own money, have my own retirement account that I needed to make investment decisions for. And I'd done a bit of trading with him when I was a kid, um, some programming, some different things. But as he's the first to say, it's different when it's your own money at stake. Um, so as I started to have my own investment accounts and I'd sit down with him and talk about what to do with my account and what he was looking at and why he was making these suggestions, I got more and more intrigued. And it came to a point where I wanted to leave a job that I was at and was talking with him about, you know, good next steps, what I might want to do. And he offered up, you know, if you ever want to come try officially doing the investment thing and working with us now is the good time to try it and i decided to make the leap and i'm quite happy i did it's really it's a fascinating industry i enjoy it keeps you on your toes always something to learn um and really interesting so i'd, I'd point out um a, a, a little bit about this you know i, I had a um a, a roughly 10-year career um in in another industry before i took up um in investing full time and um zoe did as well um she uh um and she, she had quite a successful career in international business development um and i think that that outside experience that that real life uh experience of um the world uh, is is incredibly valuable i think these guys and girls who uh, you know come up through high school and go to college and then, you know, finish off with business school and 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 launch out into these uh, investment firms and, and such like that are missing an, in, an incredibly important, important part of real life experience. Um, and that, you know, coming 
coming into this business a, a little later um, a, after having, um, uh, you know, again, real life experience, I, I think it is incredibly valuable. Nice. So, Zoe, what do you do at the Bolliger Capital Management? Tell us about your job there. I wear a couple of different hats. I think the most important part of my job is working with him on the investments. Um, we're an investment management firm. We invest both for ourselves, but also for clients. And so, you know, what I do most of every day is work with John on portfolio management. A combination of looking at our current investments, ongoing analysis of the markets and the economy broadly, and also the development of new trading systems, you know, starting with our impact program. But we've worked on a number since down to the piece that John mentioned at the beginning of the interview about a sort of dynamic approach to hedging and some volatility based approaches to creating less correlated income streams or the two things we're working on now. Um, and then I also do a lot of work with clients, um, working directly with our clients around some financial planning, some retirement planning, looking at sort of a more holistic picture of their investments and, and their life goals. And I enjoy that quite a bit as well. It's kind of a nice balance between the analytical sides of the markets and the human sides as well. I think the, the physical, um piece of it. It, it it could be interesting as well we each have our own desks um but we also have a partner's desk where we can sit together um there are two 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 separate computers and and big monitors so that um you know during certain portions of the day we we are, we are able to you know sit and do our own work and our own thoughts and and and, and such like that but then we can come together and and work on 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 problems um together as they come up um and we we developed a regular sort of schedule for that um what what we do on each day of the week and and, and such like that so um the just the, the physicality of it of it i think is an important piece um as well okay so as a trader do you do you look at fundamentals as account balance macro scenario What's your current view about the actual market that big techs are outperforming the small caps? Yeah, um, so we do, despite being known for technical analysis, and that's a big piece of what we do, as John mentioned earlier, this idea of rational analysis, that there's value from all sorts of different data and looking at them together um, is a big part of our practice. So we look not only at trading patterns, we'll use trading patterns often as confirmation of when to enter or exit a trade, but we'll also look at fundamentals, both in terms of uh, characteristics of a company, are their earnings stable, um, that kind of thing when we're considering an investment. We'll also, I think one of the most useful things for me that we do is we do a regular analysis of different sectors of the marketplace, different industry groups, and how they're performing comparatively to each other, which gives you a little bit of insight both into the market cycle, into the market cycle, into trends, and into psychology as well. Um, so we do we do a little bit of everything, with certainly a heavy emphasis on technicals. And as you mentioned earlier, it's a Federal Reserve announcement day, so I think you ignore some of these uh, fundamental aspects at your own peril because they do move the market in different ways. So uh, another aspect of this is Zoe's become very good at uh, stock screening. Mm -hmm. um, she uses uh, um, some of this, uh, um, you know, so, so, sort of, um, you know, very sophisticated analytical software to run through the, the long, long list of stocks. We have, you know, many thousands of, of stocks here to, to look at in the U.S. market. And, and we are primarily stock investors. Um, we, we use ETFs, uh, funds to... Uh, a small extent, but we're primarily stock investors. So she'll she'll develop screens of potential candidates, and then we'll go through them. You know, looking looking for opportunities. The screen the screening process itself is a combination of of technicals and fundamentals. But then you know we 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 lean more heavily on the technicals to to decide which ones to buy and when to buy them and when to sell them. 
what is your personal style as a trader? A um, couple of different things. I found um, John's not too much of a systems person. He he has all of that investment history behind him and he'll kind of look at a chart and be like i feel this one this is the right thing um maybe in 30 years i too will be there but not just yet so i i really like having a little bit of structure to help inform my trading decisions so i'll use a variety of things um most of them technical different indicators um we'll use in his book he teaches um he has a couple of Bollinger Band methods. I really started out there. There's a reversal method, um, you know, a trend following method and, and exploring some of those to help me determine entries and exits and, and which stocks I was interested in investing in. And I still, I still like to have that. I like that process of building systems, testing systems. Um, and then you don't necessarily execute every trade in the system, um, but as guidance on the investments that i might be choosing to make i'm also not a very short-term trader um i i prefer sort of day to week time frames um i don't do a lot of hourly minute bars kind of in and out of things multiple times in a day i find that partially because we are a business during trading hours and i'm looking at client work as well as system work. Um, I don't have the time to be sort of micromanaging trades in that way. And so looking for longer term day time frame type of trades work better for me. But I think, you know, that's one of the really fun things with investing is in general, you can kind of make those decisions. You can pick the style that works for you. You can pick the time frame that works for you. And as long as it's something you're comfortable with, it'll probably work out pretty well for you. Yeah. You know, I, I'm actually a little bit more of a systematic trader than than it, it, it appears. Um, I may not actually run a, a, a lot of physical systems and, and, ta and take the ta take the signals from them, but I have them running in my head. Um, so, you know, I, I'm looking for setups that, you know, I, I've learned um, over the years where the, the ideas that I talked about before, where we're going to risk a relatively small amount in in in, in pursuit of a, a larger gain, and where the odds of, of success are are in my favor. So, um, it, it it's an interesting combination uh, um, uh, of systematic trading and, and intuitive trading, um, and you know I like that combination. It works for you, huh? It has to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which tools specifically do you look at? Could you give me some examples? Um, so, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't say Bollinger Bands and the accompanying percent B and bandwidth. Um, we use, or, and I personally use a couple of different things. I do, we've been playing around. Um, as we build this hedging system with all sorts of different indicators from looking at things like MACD, which you brought up earlier, looking at stochastics um, and kind of trying to figure out a diversified set of tools that don't have that high correlation where everything's a volume indicator. Um, so I've been playing with that quite a bit lately. I like those Bollinger Band methods that are in the book. I, I find they work really well for me. And it goes back to something he talks about a lot that there are things based on first principles in the market that even if market dynamics change, um, that you still have tools that are fundamentally based on whether it's psychology, fear and greed, um, supply and demand market dynamics that kind of work continuously in different ways across different environments. Um, so I like all of that. Do you have a personal trade, trader routine? Do you have a plan? Do you follow a plan or something like this? I, I like a diary. Um, so I don't keep a diary. It actually, it's probably a good idea. I probably should. I do track my performance quite carefully. Um, maybe I do keep a diary. It's an Excel sheet, but that's like a diary. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> I do, because I find, you know, we talk a lot about emotions in trading and it's very easy to either 
remember a win too much or remember a loss too much and take kind of too much of a lesson from any single trade. So for example, last year I was, I did kind of a personal experiment in a swing trading method where I looked at two bar reversals at the upper or lower band where a stock comes down and breaks down out of the lower band and then immediately breaks back in and using that as an entry point to potentially trade through to the upper band and exit there. Um, and so I, I keep quite a careful chart of each entry, each exit, what the time frame was, percent gain and loss, so that you can run the statistics and see it might feel good or feel bad, but actually have a sense of is this system over time generating returns that are better than just a buy and hold? Um, looking at standard deviation, looking at some of those different trade metrics. So I find that to be really helpful. Um, and also for me, kind of some of that systematic thing of having a plan of on, you know, we have, I'll use that impact system as an example. Um, and we trade that both for ourselves and clients, but that's a rotational program that could rotate up to once a week. And so on Thursday, we reevaluate and we trade that. And that's the day that we look at and think about that system, um, along with kind of quarterly review of the stock list that's used. So I, I think having that regularity and that routine is really helpful to make sure that you're staying on top of things and not letting things run away from you. Yeah. One of the first things I did after um, uh, she came on board was was put together, you know, what what had been sort of my routines beforehand, but I'd never actually written them down and, set, and such like that. So we have certain tasks that we do every day and, and such like that. that I find very, very helpful. Zoe, although in Brazil there is a woman population majority, in Brazilian exchange, there are only 23% women accounts. What do you think about these inequalities? Something quite similar in the US. I don't think it's quite 23%, but there is a real majority of men who engage in investing versus women, especially on the professional. Um, investment side it's quite heavily geared towards men um i'll laugh at some of the conferences that we go to you're seeing more and more women though it's it's not quite as yeah, um it's not quite as intense as it used to be in in terms of the skew towards men but it's a really important issue i was looking at a report the other day just on um kind of women in the economy and it pointed out a couple of statistics both in terms of women's life, um, lifetime, sort of estimated length of life, being traditionally at least five years longer than men in many cases, and that the average age um, for women to become widows is actually around, it's like 59 and a half in the US. And then they often live for many, many years further and have responsibility for their own finances from that point on at the very least so i think a combination of you know financial education for women removing some of that traditional thought process that like men should be the one to take care of the finances and it's not to say that it should be only the woman either but that that should be something that's collaborative that in a relationship both partners are aware of the family finances aware of the investments comfortable speaking to an investment advisor or making their own investments whichever direction they prefer i think is really important um and it's good for the economy also yeah you know we've come a long way when back in the day we go to an investment conference it was all men i mean literally all that I mean, just a, 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 a smattering of, of women and, now, now you go and 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 it's much greater re representation. It's it's not enough, and we haven't come we haven't come far enough and fast enough. Um, but we're on the right track, you know. It, it, it's it, we're headed in, in in the right direction. So, Zoe, what advice would you give to a young to younger traders, especially for women? I think there's maybe three things, sort of three key things. The first is just to have confidence in yourself. You know, this it's not a space that's not for you. 
it's very much for you. You have every right to be here to take control of your finances, to try investing. Um, so, you know, believe in yourself and, and give it a try. The second piece is that there isn't a right way to trade. You know, people will tell you, oh, you should day trade or you should only buy and hold in the long term or you should only trade looking at daily bars or, you know, you should use leverage. You shouldn't use leverage. There really isn't a correct way to do it. The correct way to do it for you is a way that's sustainable for you. So if you have time to check in on your investments once a week, that's the way you should be investing. Um, you know, if you're interested in technical analysis and in indicators, then make a study of that and use that to trade because it's interesting and you'll stick with it. If you find technical analysis and active investment horrifying, think about something like dollar cost averaging. Take a small amount of money and invest it every week or every month or once a quarter. You'll buy high sometimes, you'll buy low sometimes, but in the end you'll be invested and, and you'll see some benefits. So figure out what works for you and, and don't let people tell you, you know, your approach isn't the right way because if you stick with it, it's the right way for you. You know, there's a fantastic body of literature um, on the Zoe last idea of uh, considering dollar cost averaging. Um, DCA or dollar uh, um, came from, uh, the post-World War II era in America, where um, people tried to come up with, with formula plans for investing. And, and, and th there are a number of books um, out there on formula plan investing. They're all written um, in the 50s and 60s. Um, it's essentially the beginnings of quantitative investing. And they had a lot of great ideas. So you know, in addition to the technical analysis literature, there's this other literature from the 50s and 60s on formula plans that is chock full of great ideas for investors. And Zoe just touched on. And I think the third thing, one of the first things that John said to me really when I like properly joined the business was that investing is a privilege and you never do anything that risks not being able to come back and do it tomorrow. And especially in COVID, we saw a lot of interest in the US grow massively in individual investing in the stock market. And in many ways, that's an extremely positive thing. But there was also a culture that came up kind of with that of bet big, bet it all, like all or nothing. Um, you know, if, if I implode, so be it. And I think if there's one piece of advice for me to new investors, it's don't do that. Um, you know, when you pick an individual investment, make that trade size a size that you can afford if it goes down a little bit. Don't bet it all and use massive leverage and allow the risk that if one trade goes against you, it would prevent you from coming back and investing tomorrow. What she said. <laughs> So please, where can our audience uh, contact you, reach you, follow you at Twitter? Please do some advertising. My my Twitter handle is at sign B B A N D S, short for Bollinger Bands. Um, but I think most importantly, um, we have we have a little Bollinger Band portal, BollingerBands.com. Um, you can you can visit that if you want to see um some bollinger band analytics in real time for for stocks and and such you can go to bollingerbands.us um but yeah I, I our real business here is capital management um and our portal for our management business is bollingercapital.com yep we covered them great everything's gonna be on the, the description right out below <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. And we come to an end of this amazing interview with John and Zoe Bollinger. We want to thank you all, our viewers, for joining us in this journey. Next we time also in San Paulo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you, 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 both, you three, né? you three, we have to read to both come to San Paulo next year to our expo trader again, uh, the six, our six, number six. And we also, 
We also want to say thank you to John, to Zoe, of course, to Reed, I know she's here, <laughs> for sharing your wonderful stories and wonderful, remarkable achievements with, with us. We hope that your accomplishments and dedication inspire much other traders. Thank you. Our best to all our Brazilian friends. It's a pleasure to be there. And, you know, we would love to see mm -hmm. you in person, hopefully soon. Nice. Thank you, everyone. We see you in the next interview.